I'm excited to welcome back Wesley Lowry. He previously joined us for his New York Times bestseller, seller, bestseller, They Can't Kill Us All, Ferguson, Baltimore, and a New Era in America's Racial Justice Movement. The book won the Christopher Isherwood Prize for Autobiographical Prose from the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. In his new bestseller, American White Lash, A Changing Nation, and the Cost of Progress, Lowry examines the cyclical pattern of violence that marks each watershed moment of racial progress in this country, most recently evidenced by the resurgence of white supremacist movements during and following Obama's 2008 presidential election. Formerly the Washington Post lead journalist in Ferguson during the aftermath of the murder of Michael Brown, Lowry, together with his team, won the 2016 Pulitzer for national reporting for the paperage paper's coverage of police shootings. In 2019, he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for his project, Murder with Impunity, and he is currently a contributing editor at the Marshall Project and journalist in residence at the CUNY Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Tonight, he'll be in conversation with award-winning journalist, broadcaster, longtime interviewer here, and library friend, Tracy Matisak. Please give them a warm welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your Thursday evening with us. Uh, we hope that you'll enjoy our conversation tonight. And as always, we have budgeted some time for your questions for our guest, Wesley Lowry. So um, jot down any questions that come to mind as we go through our conversation. That said, Wesley Lowry, welcome back to Thanks the Free so Library. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. So the book is called American White Lash, A Changing Nation and the Cost of progress. And Wesley, you begin the book on the evening of November 4th, 2008, when Barack Obama was elected the first black president of the United States. And there was for so many Americans such a sense of elation and this feeling that this was a real step in the direction of racial progress. And yet for other Americans, um, it was a kind of a last straw, if you will, and it was the catalyst for what you and Van Jones on CNN have termed white lash. And so I'd like to start there. Of course, that ultimately led to the rise of Donald Trump and the emboldening of white supremacists across the country. Um, can you start off by explaining what kind of dynamics were going on around the time of Obama's election? that led us to where we are. Certainly, well, first of all, it's great to be here uh, and great to see you all. Um, and looking forward to chatting a bit and getting some of your questions as well. You know, when we think about that moment, it's really interesting to think back and even to watch the news coverage of the night Barack Obama was elected. You can find it all on YouTube. And you watch it and it's like taking yourself back to a world that is very foreign to the world we live in today. Everyone was happy, there was all this excitement. It's like, has America beaten racism? Who knows, right? You know, like the headlines were kind of like crazy and deranged, like now, and now retrospectively, we're like, wait, what? Uh, that's what we thought had happened? And, and there was so much, you know, even though it's not that long ago, so much that has changed. We were at the time, you know, in two unpopular foreign wars. We had taken very little action uh, towards climate change, and there was a lot of frustration on the political left around those issues. We were in the midst of an e economic downturn um, and deep economic instability across the country. And, and we had been seeing a rise in immigration and debates around immigration becoming one of the most salient domestic political issues. And so in the midst of all of this, we elect a black guy with a funny name um, to become the President of the United States of America. And we pretty naively think, well, perhaps this has solved the, in all of American history, and we are now going to be this great united multiracial democracy. Um, and instead, what we see very quickly is the rise and the codification of a nativist political movement in our politics. We see a deep anxiety that sets into the biggest racial group in our populace, which is white Americans. By the end of the Obama administration, 55% of white Americans believe they are racially discriminated against, right? And so we have one black president and white Americans literally begin to believe they are racial minorities in America. Um, we see a 
in the funnel, right? So that's your majority of white Americans now believe they're racial minorities. A smaller subsection of them join an openly nativist political movement that questions the citizenship of the president and, his, and where he's from, that uh, becomes remarkably aggressive around issues of immigration, trade, refugees, vows to construct a moat around the country so brown people can't come in and to stop all Muslims from coming. They elect the leader of their movement, become the president of the United States of America, um, and elect members of this movement into Congress and state houses across the country, um, ultimately replacing the black president with an openly nativist president. And as all of this is happening, we have, even further down the funnel, an explicitly avowed white supremacist movement that has always been present and has always been here in America that is watching now as the white population of America becomes increasingly radicalized, increasingly anxious, increasingly concerned about issues of immigration and who really belongs here and if the country has changed in ways that it can never be changed back. And that movement smiles because it knows that this is going to create a fertile recruiting ground uh, for, for what they want to see. And so what we see over these years is a rise in the amount of violence committed by white supremacists and white supremacist groups. We see, um, according to our FBI director and DHS directors, you know, white supremacist terror becoming the singular most active threat to American lives in the United States of America, not um, Islamic terrorism, which had been the preoccupation and the obsession since 9-11, right? And we see time and time again individual disaffected white Americans who, due to the coarseness of our mainstream political, rhetor political rhetoric, find themselves down into these dark spaces where they're proselytized to, converted, and ultimately commit acts that take people's lives. And some of those acts were committed, Wesley, as you write, within hours of Obama's election. I start the book with the death of Marcelo Lucero, who is an Ecuadorian immigrant who lives in Long Island and is murdered days after Barack Obama is elected. And one of the reasons I do that specifically is to show and to talk about how we can't divide history into these clean buckets in this way, right? That someone who's murdered within two or three days of Barack Obama's election, we can't say, okay, well, this is a causation. That this is speaking to dynamics that were already playing out. That Marcelo Lucero lived in a place where immigrants were already being demagogued, where local political leaders had been using them as scapegoats, and where the rhetoric had become so dangerous and so dehumanizing that high school students would go out on the weekends seeking immigrants to attack. And that is how Marcelo Lucero gets killed, is a group of high school students spending their Friday night driving around town looking for immigrants to beat up. And so Marcelo is killed just days after Barack Obama is elected, right? And so it speaks to uh, this idea of this was where we were starting on day one of a black presidency, a world where the, the rhetoric around immigration in this country was so vitriolic that we had people being attacked by mobs of, of white kids in the streets. And then we inaugurated a black president. And, and so we think about, and so I think we have to understand that, uh, that idea of when we look at the, the election of Barack Obama, I think, and this is not in any way question the depth and historical importance of that moment, right? But I think we make a mistake to think of it as the ushering in of something new as opposed to the continuation of something that was already happening. Yeah, and speaking of that, um, you do talk about how certainly the concept of backlash against racial progress is nothing new. We have seen it throughout our history in this country. And you talk about how the second iteration of the Klan in the 1920s, you write about how they bear a striking resemblance in ideology to today's MAGA movement. Talk about that, if you would. Certainly, and I think that it's something that we, I think if we were better versed in our history, we would feel much more comfortable sitting with and grappling with these realities, right? We have been in this moment before. Let's think a little bit about what America was like in the 19, in the 19 teens and in the, and then in the 20s, right? And what the world was like in that moment. We had an openly bigoted president named Woodrow Wilson, uh, who took steps to resegregate federal facilities um, not that long after this massive societal restructuring in which suddenly black and brown Americans were allowed to vote and, and, were, and were considered fully citizen, right? Uh, this, we were coming out of our first attempts at a multiracial democracy and in the, and we're seeing the rise of the Jim Crow backlash and, and white supremacy's redemption. We, 
are in a time where there's foundational fundamental shifts in the economy and in the topography of the country. For the first time in American history, more people live in cities than live in rural environments where we have urbanization, we have the rise of jazz music and birth control, right? Technological advances is what we'd call birth control back then, right? But the idea that suddenly uh, women could have sex, right? And, 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 not ha and not be concerned about becoming pregnant, right? So there was a liberation and so what we're seeing now is a different conversation about roles of gender and race and, and, and how those things show up. There's these cultural innovations. Suddenly people are dancing to jazz music, which seems kind of similar to suddenly the Little Mermaid being black, right? Like we have all these things that are happening. And in the midst of all of this, we have a rising of anti-Semitism among public figures. And there's a this conflict that's breaking out in Eastern Europe. And there's this massive debate about whether to what extent we should be involved in it or we should not. Um, and the country is seeing demographic change being driven by immigration. And so what happens in that moment? We see the rise of, oh, and by the way, technology and mass media allows for a racist indoctrinization. The, there is a play that becomes a movie, a silent film, and civil rights leaders said, if we allow this to be shown in theaters, it's going to lead to violence. And the director of it, D.W. Griffith, said they're trying to cancel me and censor me. And if they want to combat my free speech, they should just make their own movie. More speech is the answer to this. And so A Birth of the Nation went out across the country, giving rise to the second Ku Klux Klan, a political movement that was not just uh, angry with black Americans, but rather was a political movement that looks m so much like the current MAGA movement, a movement that was not something that you could describe as Southern or poor, that there are as many Klansmen elected across the North and the Midwest as there are in the South, uh, a movement that is social and political, a movement that is as much about a hatred of black Americans as it is a hatred of Jewish Americans and Catholic Americans and urbanization as, and immigration that when the Klan is at the height of its political power, it passes an Immigration Act. It is its chief political accomplishment in American history, is changing the way the immigration system works in 1924. Uh, the Johnson-Reed Act, named after a Klansman. And so we see this massive reactionary, conservative, nativist rise driven by an explicitly racist media that is able to be perpetuated across the country because liberal institutions say, well, we believe in free speech, so they're allowed to watch this Klan propaganda over the, over the objections of civil rights leaders at the time. And what we end up seeing is an era where our national politics is captured by this nativist movement. The Klan is the most powerful movement in the country at the time. And in which, and in which black Americans Brown Americans, immigrants, and Jewish Americans face physical violence and physical threat. It's very hard to read that history and look at that history and not see the world that we live in today. Um, and yet I think very often we're incapable of saying that because the politics of our moment don't allow us to say, well, the MAGA movement's just like the Klan. There's an implication and a sensitivity. But the reality is we have seen this movie before. I want to talk about anti-Semitism. You mentioned that just a moment ago, and of course there have been any number of mm -hmm. examples of that, but I'd like to zero in on the case of Glenn Miller, mm -hmm. um, who, as you wrote, and I'm quoting you here, committed one of the deadliest anti-Semitic attacks in U.S. history without killing a single Jew. Remind us of who he was and what animated him to commit these crimes. Yeah, there's my small amount of humor and something so miserable that this is this man's entire life mission and he even failed at that, right? That he had shot up a Jewish community center in a retirement home in Kansas City, Kansas and, and frankly only happened to kill non-Jewish people who were there that day, right? Um, and so it was horrible and also, well, there you go, Glenn. Uh, this was a man who his own personal history had traced in a lot of ways the modern history of American white supremacy. This was someone who became radicalized by receiving a white supremacist tract from his father, the Thunderbolt newspaper and magazine, which was the way that a lot of the recruitment happened back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, who sought out initially Klan groups, then later joined militia groups and neo-Nazi groups, um, was briefly involved with some of the most violent and aggressive white supremacist groups of the late 80s and early 90s, 
turned state's witness and betrayed his entire movement, uh, becomes a mega poster on these online uh, websites, and then finally decides in the late years of his life that he is going to attempt to carry out an attack. What was interesting is, I think that when we look at that case, we see a few things that are true. The first is that we watch the progression of this movement, that that the uh, historian David Chalmers, who's the leading historian on the history of the Klan, he writes in his book, uh, Hooded Americanism, that the Klan for all of its history, and we can use the Klan as a stand-in for white supremacists in this way, because for much of our history, they're the, they're the Yankees of the, t you know, that it's the, um, that the Klan for most of its history is dispositionally conservative. They were defenders of a white supremacist society that already existed. They were attempting to conserve things and keep them the way they are. They were, they were a reaction to attempts at progress, right? But they didn't actually believe there needed to be a fundamental change to society. Following the victories of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, the Klan and the white supremacist movement writ large enters a new and unique era. It, for the first time, becomes a revolutionary terroristic movement that they now believe they have to overturn American society and government the way it exists that they now occupy not an explicitly white supremacist state, but they occupy a multiracial democracy, one that they believe threatens the existence of their, what they believe is their race, right? We know race is not real. Um, and so we see this, right? And so Glenn Miller comes up at the very time of this dispositional shift. And this dispositional shift allows for things that wouldn't have been possible within the white supremacist movement previously. Klansmen marching next to neo-Nazis is not something that would have happened in the 1950s, right? Because by the very nature of while they might have been a different, you know, might have been the same religion, they were very different denominations, right? And the idea of a blue-blooded American Klansman marching against a Nazi was not a thing they would have done. Well, so why do we see that in the 80s and 90s? Why do we see this flattening of this movement across? There used to be all these gradations, and now they're all meeting together at the what they called the Aryan Nation compound in Idaho is because fundamentally their tactic and their urgency had shifted and it had changed. That they initially start, and we see this with Miller again, they initially start with these kind of hierarchical organizations. Right? They're all getting together, they're all meeting, and I'm president and you're vice president, and we're gonna, and the FBI begins infiltrating those. People get caught. They, uh, they commit a crime and organizations like the SBLC are able to sue them and or sue the organization out of existence, seize all their land, seize all their money. And so in the late 80s, they develop this, and they write in this track, a tactic of what they call leaderless resistance, where their goal, the explicit stated tactic of the white supremacist movement in America, is not to build these hierarchical structures, but rather to use our mainstream politics and current events to poison the minds of white Americans and so that those white Americans will be susceptible to their proselytization and to their propaganda, and that those Americans will know what to do. And we see this from Timothy McVeigh to Dylan Roof to the shooters in Pittsburgh and in, and in Buffalo and in El Paso. There's a reason the manifestos all read the same. It's a reason they behave in the exact same way. That this was a plan that was laid out and that when no one actually places the gun in your hand and tells you what to do, no one can then be held liable for it. Yet this was a deliberate tactic, uh, terroristically to hope that ultimately this type of chaos and violence would lead to what they believe will one day be the great race war that they win in X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Speaking of, there has been so much chatter about race wars, and there was um, a Marine, an active duty Marine who was arrested in connection with January 6th, who was quoted as saying that he was waiting for Civil War II. Um, and as I mentioned, there's been a lot of chatter about this idea of a race war, about people training for something. Does that threat feel more real now than it has in the past? Um, <clears throat> you know, with the caveat that I don't like to prognosticate because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, we live in a world where we're talking about former President Donald Trump, so I don't, you know, I, I can't, uh, I don't know what we're going to be talking about five years from now. But... <laughs> That said, um, I, I don't know that I feel like there's a more present or more urgent idea of actual armed conflict. I do think that it is not guaranteed that we will collectively, our society collectively, will decide uh, 
that we want to continue going on the same path together. So what I mean by that is, I think the question at the core of our union from the very beginning was who we would, who we would be a democracy for. Are we a democracy for all or are we a democracy for some? And there are deep ideological fissures about the answer to that question. We live in a country where some people believe in multiracial democracy and full equality and equity and others do not. And I think it becomes very hard for us to move forward collectively together when everything in our politics ends up being a proxy war for that fight. And, um, and so in so much as that, you know, we, we've seen, we've seen, you know, what we call the great sort where we now, we, we've now retreated into our tribes, depending on the answer to that question and its derivative questions that determines where we live and where we work and where we shop and which fast food restaurant we go to and which one we don't, what television shows we watch, what music we listen to, right, that we are existing within separate segregated societies within our collective union. And, and so while we're living in the same country, so often we're already occupying completely different worlds. And, and so, again, it, it seems hard, almost unfathomable, to think about the type of armed conflict we once saw here, a civil war breaking out, right? But if you told me that there might be deep structural changes to how our union is set up, to who's a member of it and who isn't, I, I couldn't tell you that, that that's out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. And, and you write about how maybe the most pressing question of our time is how the government can balance the right to free speech, even the free speech of racists, with the right of everyone else to remain safe. Not just the, go the government, and by extension, uh, our institutions, right? Our society at large. Because there's this question of, right, what are, what are we? foundationally, what are we? What is our organizing and collective principle for being here? And there's an argument that the, you know, so at our founding, the easy answer to that would have been that we believed in, in speech, in this individualized liberty, this, this ability to, I worship how I want to worship, I do what I want to do, and you have to stay away from me. And, and you can't infringe upon that, no one can infringe upon that. There is an argument, and I, I would, might suggest that when we refound American democracy in 68 after the Voting Rights Act, when we decide for the first time to be a multiracial democracy, we now place at the cornerstone of our aspirational society an equality that had not existed in our American history. Well, what happens when that value clashes with a value of hyper-individualized liberty and speech? We know that certain types of speech compel violence towards other types of people. It's a settled question. History has shown us this, right? Um, and so what do we do as a society that now for the first time has to actually value the safety of different types of people? How does that force us to think about or consider how we, to, the supremacy of these various values, right? In a world where we for example, from the institution that I'm a member of, because again, we think about it, right? Our society and is, what institutions do is they reinforce, they defend, they establish the norms of a society like this, right? And so what does it mean to have a media that, that hyper-prioritizes this idea of speech versus to have a media that hyper-prioritizes uh, multiracial multiculturalism, right? It might lead you to very different decisions in a world in which the equality and safety and equity of opportunity is, is supreme in, in terms of the, uh, what our institutions stand to uphold, we probably would not air rallies of nativist conspiracy theorists on live television to millions of people. We would probably never put such a person on live television. In a world where, well, but if he's a public figure, therefore we have to put him on TV, right? In a world, we, that leads us to a different set of decisions, right? And I think that at its core, I think we're having a real grapple across all of our institutions about what are our core values in our society? Because we know, right? You know who would not air such a rally? The Germans. It would be illegal. Tucker Carlson would be arrested. He couldn't say this stuff on television. Hmm. 
And so, and no one would suggest that is not a free society that values speech and the, that is Western or whatever, whatever word we want to use for our belief of our own enlightenment, right? That other countries also grapple with these ideas and the understanding that history, human history has shown us that when you allow people to demonize and degrade and dehumanize people, those people are treated as less than human and bad things happen to them. You mentioned a moment ago, and you, you write at length about how our govern, government was late to the party as it mm -hmm. relates to keeping an eye on domestic terrorists, because there was so much attention focused on Islamic terrorism, for mm -hmm. example, after 9-11. Um, but there was a Department of Homeland Security expert named Daryl Johnson who was paying attention to that, and he wrote a report on domestic terrorists where he warned that the military was what he called an indispensable pipeline for white supremacist groups. Now, of course, that was not exactly well received no. at the time uh, that that report was written. Can you talk a little bit about that and what we have seen, of course, since then? So in the book, I interview both of the first two people to be the Secretary of Homeland Security, a mega department created after 9-11. And both of them acknowledged that their mandates at the time while they would have included, theoretically, domestic terror and white supremacist groups, their job was to prevent another 9-11. Yeah. That their resources, that their focus, that their efforts were on international Islamic terrorism and disrupting it. Despite the fact that we know that in that very moment, we had many of the exact types of cultural and societal things that over the course of history have resulted or have accompanied rises in white supremacist terror. Again, we're talking about the early 2000s, a time when we, if we were not in the midst of an economic crisis, had just emerged from one, right? There's almost no point in that, in that era in which we were not deeply thrashing economically. We had, we had ground troops being sent to full-scale foreign wars and returning. Uh, the researcher Catherine Ballou writes in Bringing the a War Home that Oh, that recruitment for white supremacist groups almost always increases and does better when you have returning soldiers because you very often have um, relatively uneducated, conservative law enforcement ideologues with connections to conservative media, very often who are dealing with the unseen wounds uh, and traumas of war, who are returning, feeling mistreated, feeling thrown off and often find themselves being recruited into these spaces aggressively. These groups do this on purpose, right? If you want to start a race war, you would start with all the guys who know how the guns work, right? Um, and, and so we see, I mean, active recruitment by white supremacists on army bases and, and among returning veterans, right? Not that they are personally predisposed in some way, but that the circumstances make them particularly vulnerable to this type of proselytization. And we see that we're at a time where following the changes in immigration policy, we were seeing a massive shift, right? We, there's, the face of the country has never demographically changed as quickly as it has over the last five decades in terms of who is an American, right? And we can hold that there's nothing wrong with that while also acknowledging that that is going to spark and create an anxiety among a population that is suddenly seeing a bunch of people who don't look like them. And so all these things are happening at once. And our federal law enforcement is worried about people across the, the world, even as what's happening here is this rise. And then you insert into that a charismatic black man whose middle name is Hussein, who's going to run to become the president of the United States. And we see these assessments start to be run. So Daryl Johnson, the President Obama, and they're coordinating. And then after that, he's asked to create a paper about white supremacist groups and what they might face and what might be going on in these years to come. And he writes a report that they send out and, and, and he writes that he seems, he seems like it's very likely we're gonna see these groups recruiting and organizing on the internet, that the idea of these returning veterans, they might be hyper susceptible to this and so that's something we need to pay attention to, the way immigration's playing out. And congressional Republicans and immigrant groups or not immigrant groups, I'm sorry, and veterans groups, seize on this. And they say the Obama administration says all Republicans are white supremacists and all military veterans are white supremacists. And the Department of Homeland Security uh, retracts the report and tears it up and, according to Daryl Johnson, disbands his unit. Uh, 
And that is how we began the first black presidency, with the Department of Homeland Security receiving a report is remarkably prescriptive of what we would see in the decade to come. Yeah. One of your goals, Wesley, in writing the book was to put names and faces to victims of white supremacist violence. And you write about Richard Collins III, mm. who was murdered in Maryland in 2017. He was stabbed to death at a bus stop. He was there with a couple of friends. And, and the man who did it belonged to a racist Facebook group he had racist cartoons stored on his phone. Um, he ignored the white and Asian companions that Richard was with uh, the night that he was killed. And ultimately, the Sean Urbanski was conv convicted of murder, but he was not convicted of a hate crime. Um, can you talk about the challenges that are associated with proving that a crime was motivated by hate, even when it appears to be obvious? I think that we get caught in that, right? And it's, it's tough, it's difficult, because we end up in these debates, both in our public square, but then also in the actual mechanisms of our legal system, about how do we litigate, whether it be motivation or background. We might be able to prove that this person is racially prejudiced, but did they do this thing because of the racial prejudice? And we both see, from a justice perspective, we see why the distinctions and nuances might matter. And we also see how to the black person on the street who's been murdered, and their family, that this seems extremely semantic, right? That, and, I, and I think that's part of our difficulty. When we look at these issues, we you know, we know, for example, that hate crimes are, are remarkably underreported, that victims have very little incentive to come forward. Uh, that it is, in, in some of these cases, you have matter of perception or matter of, of in-depth litigation. Is this technically this thing? Is it technically this other thing? We know that there are many groups who were not even counted among potential hate crime victims when, when there was the massacre at the Sikh temple, Sikhs weren't counted, despite the fact that since 9-11 they had been targeted and attacked routinely in the United States of America. Um, and so we see this kind of time and time and time again, both an incomplete and a, a lacking nature of how we record these things, but then also a real difficult nature in how we reconcile them and how we deal with them, right? Mm -hmm. That in Maryland, under, in, during the Collins case or the Urbanski prosecution, it had to be, the, the way the law was written is you had to prove that it was like the sole motivating factor for the, for the crime. Well, Sean Urbanski was blacked out drunk at the time, right? And so his, his attorneys argued, well, there was at least one other motivating factor here, right? Um, and they were able to argue and get the law changed to make it so it has to be one of a motivating factor, right? It's, it, there's a nuance there. But we also see how in a courtroom where theoretically it's the tribunal seeking justice, we see how those nuances and those complexities, even if we're not arguing against them, we see how they would leave the family of a victim feeling remarkably underserved, right? That this becomes this like semantic debate about exactly why their black child was murdered by a guy who's a member of a racist Facebook group. Um, and I think that that starts to become, and I, and I think that that's a stand-in sometimes for our bigger and our broader debates around these issues. Yeah. We, we debate and talked endlessly about, well, exactly what percentages of the Trump people could we say are racially motivated? You know, it only takes one of those people to encounter an immigrant in the street or to walk into a, into a Walmart parking lot or to a synagogue, right? And so, the, <laughs> and so this idea that it only takes a handful of them to take seriously the come, come on January 6th to the Capitol to over, almost overthrow our democracy. So... I think that while it's important for us to focus on fact and detail, I do think sometimes we can't miss the forest for the trees. So even as these supremacist groups have become more emboldened in recent years, um, a lot of activists have risen mm -hmm. up as well. And I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that, about what resistance looks like at this point and what the call to action is for people who are paying attention to all this, who care deeply about this, and want to be part of the solution. You know, I think that one thing I think about, and I write this in the book, is that I think about our history as a tug of war, where a country is founded uh, legally 
as a white supremacist country, right? In, in that we write into our laws this idea of race and that being of a white race will cede you a certain set of rights and if you are of the other race, you, you don't have those, right? We create it. And, and um, in response to that, we, we see activism and revolution to push for multiculturalism, multicultural equality, and a multiracial democracy. We see this in the slave revolts, we see this in the abolitionist movement, we see this in the civil rights movement, we see this in the current anti-racist movement. And, but I think that what we forget is that it's a tug of war. I think we've all been seduced by Hollywood that we think, like, okay, and then everything's bad for the first 20 minutes, and then minute 22, the great an the, the activists come in, they fix it, Martin Luther King marches over the bridge, we play that John Legend song, and then like in, by minute 29, racism's fixed. <laughs> Roll credits. Right? <laughs> and we forget what happens in, in like minute 31 after the credits, which is they murder everyone and take it all back. It was actually literally what happened to all those people on the bridge. Like, a lot of them actually got murdered. You know, like, like I mean, literally, I don't even mean that glibly, right? That this fight is a tug of war. That when you pull in one direction, the other direction pulls back. And, and so what we've seen throughout our history is that each step, each victory towards multiracial democracy and multiculturalism has always been accompanied by a violent backlash from those who benefit from a white supremacist system. And, and we see this time and time and time again. We see this structurally, and we see this individually. We see this with the white supremacist riots across the South to banish the multiracial democracy that comes during Reconstruction. We see this in the violent response and resegregation of our schools and our neighborhoods following the Great Migration as black people start showing up across the North and the Midwest and the West, right? That at each moment of a step towards this we see a majority white population in our country respond and react violently. The historian Carol Anderson calls it white rage. And, and I think that, you know, to come full circle, sitting there in November 2008, we should have known that that was what was coming. Our history makes very clear what was about to happen in minute 31 of this movie. And in fact, many people did. I remember talking to black people at the time, most black people, especially older black people, were all like, there's no way they let him live all four years. <laughs> Truly. Yeah. Most black Americans, older ones especially, were like, I, I'm just, I pray for them every day and I hope they don't assassinate that brother. That was not some, if we heard what they were saying, that was not some belief that we had entered post-racial America. It was that we know what happens. We've seen this movie. And I think we would have done better to pay closer attention to that. Yeah. But my feeling has been that because of the kind of man that Obama was, most Americans, most white Americans, were very admiring of him for his good qualities. And I didn't personally ever really feel that there was this tremendous animus as a result of his having been elected. Now, keep in mind, he won easily against uh, Mitt Romney, and Mitt Romney was not an extreme right-wing type uh, candidate. But I also want to say that Let's remember, as, as noxious and horrific as the atmosphere is, it's still true that Hillary had three million more votes than Trump. Biden had seven million more votes, and the obscene electoral system is really not a helpful uh, situation because when you throw that off the table, you know if you could imagine feeling really confident that the majority, the clear majority, is for decency, for the right kind of value, and for rejecting the horrific 
uh, side. Mm. But of course, we're stuck with the system we have. Well, yeah, but I might complicate that a little bit. A seven million, seven million in a country of three, 300 million is the margin of error. That's not a clear majority. Um, and the, that it's a coin flip in both elections, Biden and Hillary. Uh, the, the Trump, that the Trump, that the Trump coalition includes many people who voted for Barack Obama twice, many white Americans who voted for Barack Obama twice. So which way do we count them? In our, you know, we can have a desire to suggest, well, they must not be attracted to these things. Well, but they were. And, and so, but what's also true, and I don't know that I've seen this study done on the election of racial minorities, but they've done this study on the election of women. And in countries where you have a historic first, a woman prime minister, you actually see an increase in misogynistic expression because everyone can't be a misogynist because I voted for her. That you had millions of Americans who now had a black friend named Barack. But now let me tell you about the Muslims. Now let me tell you about the immigrants. And this isn't about race. I just think this critical race theory is woke stuff's going too far. But I voted for Barack Obama twice. And so I think that we, you know, I actually think we make a big mistake when we think about, when we think about that coalition in those terms, right? There are many, I'm from the Midwest, in Cleveland. I know many cops and firefighters who were union Democrats their entire lives, who voted for Barack Obama twice, and as long as Trump is on the ballot, will never vote for anyone else, who are extremely attracted to all of the things that we would find, that many of us would find and label as bigoted. And so there were many people who previously would have been thought to be in this multiracial coalition. But as you also know, we, what we are seeing is we have a system that is foundationally and fundamentally undemocratic, right? The, that we don't live in a world where you need 50 plus one. Um, and as much as democracy would be, and, and if there was truly this supermajority of people in favor of such a thing, perhaps we would have changed the system at some point. But there is many people in the democratic coalition standing in the way of such democratic changes and advancement as there are Republicans. And, and so, you know, as a member of the District of Columbia, as a, someone who's in the District of Columbia and so therefore doesn't get a vote, um, you know, I, I would love it if more establishment Democrats were interested in democracy. Um, but it doesn't seem that they are. And, and so I, I both, I don't think we need to be fatalistic. I, I take that point. I think it's a well-made point, right? But what I'll also say, again, is margin of error victories in a world where it takes one crazy guy to march into my church and murder my grandmother mean very little to me. So I love how you, well, maybe not love, but I mean, how you open up with, you know, Marcelo Lucero right after, you know, Obama, and then you go back 200, 100 plus years and then you tell stories, and each time you would tell a story, my, like my mouth would drop open, like, oh my God, this is worse than I thought, and it was, you know, New Orleans, Italians in New Orleans, and almost the birth of how Columbus Day, and I would tell my family, oh my God, do you believe this is what happened here? And, and I just felt like, and I know it wasn't your intent, but through each story, and you tie to the personalization of, of you know, someone that died, and, um, and I just kept feeling this anxiety Right, and I just feel like the, the the lash after each event is getting greater and greater. And you talk about this tug of war, right? And then you kind of end the book and you talk about, you know, Josello Marcello taking you to see the plaque of his brother, mm -hmm. and then it's not there anymore. And I'm just wondering, like, what do you, you know, feeling, you know, with the election coming up and what happened on, you know, January 6th, like, this has been going on for forever in our country, and. You know, my son's here, and I, I worry about the future, and it's just like, wow, I just have fit this pit of anxiety. And, and there's that 31st minute in the movie, and it's like, what can we do? When, you, you know, when your book came out, I said, my wife, finally, someone's saying it or so articulately, but I'm just not seeing more people talk about it. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, should I feel as hopeless as I felt as, as I, <laughs> when I finished your book, and, and how do you feel? Well, I think a few things. I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate you reading it and reading it closely and being here. I think there are a few things. I think the first is that, and I mean this, I believe this, I, I think that one of the reasons that I write about this type of stuff um, is that is not from a cynical standpoint, 
Now, granted, I'm, I'm also not a rose, rose-colored glasses. It's all going to get better, the arc of the universe. Like I said, I don't... It's a tug of war, and one day some, one side might fall down and the other side might win, right? But, um, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I think sometimes about in his last book before his death, John McCain wrote, the title was, It's Always Darkest Before It's Completely Black, <laughs> right? <laughs> and like this inversion of the idea, oh, it's always darkest before the dot, like, or before the end, right? And, and which, which he writes in the context of the Donald Trump takeover of the Republican Party. He chose in his final message to all of us, like, hey, guys, <laughs> wake up. But what I will say is that throughout our history, um, that these moments in these acts almost always spark and give way to tugs in the other direction. In so much as we think about this violence as a response to what we believe is progress and our hope, right? And that it leads to this. Well, then the rope is pulled in the other direction as well. We forget the the wave of civil rights activism sparked by the lynching of Emmett Till. Now, we hate to have lived in a time and a space where such a thing could happen. And in response to that, we see Rosa Parks and Birmingham and, and, and so and Montgomery and Atlanta and Nashville. And so what we know is that as long as there are, and getting to that earlier point, right, there are tens of millions. And there are, and I believe, I don't even want to be glib about it. I think that there is a clear pro democracy, pro multiculturalism, or pro multiracial democracy majority in this country. Now, when we get to the details, exactly how much of it do we agree on, that's a little different. But there is a clear majority of Americans who don't want to live in a world of these terrors and these horrors. And in, in response to them, we see a rise and a response, and people who are determined to create a world that looks different. And I think what's hard for us, I think the thing we have to hold, is I think sometimes we can be seduced into believing that we can just coast to the finish line of it. <laughs> right, that we've like hit the 50 plus 1% and we're gonna get there, and so that means I can just hang out over here and do my thing, because those guys, they've got it. And the race isn't over, right? And I think that that, and the folks who, are, who feel like they're losing, they certainly aren't treating the race like it's over. And I think that, I think, is some of the message, right? There is an urgency. There, it does matter. But the only way we can, we talk about this in the journalistic context, right? That one of the mistakes we make as people who are charged with reflecting objective reality is what happens if we see the world we want to see as opposed to the world as it actually is. We elected Barack Obama. We're in post-racial America. Besides being wrong, what does that do to our ability to defend our society, to know what's going on, to understand how urgent something is or not urgent? Donald Trump could never win, so I don't have to worry about these things. right? What happens, and one of the things I think empowers us to see the world as it possibly is, is to understand what the world is capable of. Right? It doesn't even have to be, doesn't even have to be cynical. Or it, it's that, no, 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 but we collectively are capable of such a thing. So therefore, we have to guard against it. Right? And I think that that becomes a big part of it as well. I remember, then I'll shut up. I remember at, when I was at the Washington Post covering uh, policing for years, and we would talk about the role, and I, and I saw this in a decade of this type of coverage, and covering very often violence and misbehavior committed by police officers increasingly captured on camera. And what was very interesting was the delineation very often between reporters based on their own personal experiences and backgrounds of what they had believed the police capable of previously. Right? That if you'd grown up with a certain experience, an allegation or that the police just pulled me over for no reason was not something you actually felt the need to take like hyper skeptically. You wanted to cross the T's and dot the I's and figure out what had happened. Well, there was a whole other set of reporters who go, police would never do that. Mm. Well, how did that then shape whose accounts they took credibly, what stories they followed up on, right? That versus when now you can see on video what is possible, 
suddenly it brings a different ability to understand the scope and the breadth of what could be true in the world, right? We could never become Germany, so it doesn't matter that Trump holds hate rallies live on TV all night. Versus a world where we sit, I was just in Israel and Palestine uh, a week or two ago, so I, that's on my mind, I was sitting in the Holocaust Museum, right? And you look at what is possible and suddenly that makes you take very seriously some of these other things. So I think that's the thing we have to guard for and think about. And like I said, for me, I always look at, I take a lot of encouragement from the young people who are coming up behind us because they have a clarity. They see these issues with clarity and they see the things they want to be different and they want to change and they do them. Things change, can change very rapidly. In, and that is both, and I think we can take that as a challenge to make sure that that rapidness moves in the way we want it to. Thank you for your talk. My question is really simple. Um, how will you feel and what will you do when your book is banned in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I'm not being facetious. No, I know, I know. Because what is most troublesome for, I mean, look at where we are right now, America library, the free library, mm. but, but I, I'm really concerned about yeah. your access to young minds. Mm. You know, I think there are a few things here. Um, the more joking answer is that that'll be helpful. I'll sell some more books that way. All my, <laughs> all my friends are banned in places and I feel a little left out. <laughs> but, um, but I think that there is a, and I, I should have mentioned this when we were talking about the 1920s, because they also banned a bunch of anti-racist literature quote unquote communist literature, like all, I mean these, again, we are very oddly in a, you know, but the idea that education has been such a battleground around these issues has deep precedent. It is unsurprising, it's deeply troubling. I, I think it says something about Again, I think it says something about what these fights are actually about. Because a lot of these are the, the free speech folks. You have to let Fox News do what it does. You have to let mm. Trump say what he does. But we're banning all the black people's books from schools. Right? Like it's, um, it's so clearly it's not actually quite about that. Um, I'm encouraged that on, on two fronts. One, that there are people who are standing up and fighting these fights, whether it be PEN America and others, and there is a real lobby of people who value um, and defend. I also know that there is a, in the moment we have now, we have access, and our young people have access in ways they never did before. Right, that you, you truly cannot destroy an idea, and you couldn't previously either. Right, the the um, the Germans in Poland burned all the all the books, and in the Warsaw Ghetto, the socialists and the communists started their own underground newspapers. They were literally in like a four-block underground ghetto, about about to be massacred and they started newspapers. And I came back with three books of the, of the newspapers. That we know, my friend Nicole Hannah Jones says this, we know that the reason people are so upset and so aggressive is because these ideas are finding audience, is because they've spread, it's because they're making a difference because young people are growing up and saying, yeah, this is the truth. That's why it's so threatening. And I take very seriously the threat of that. And also, I feel very confident, one, that we'll find a way to, to keep getting this stuff out to people because people, generations that had far fewer tools than we did, found a way. But second, that... <laughs> You want to hide some information from a teenager? Have fun. <laughs> right? like, especially in the world we live in now where we walk around with a reference library in our, at our fingertips. Yeah. We, each of us has a printing press in our hand. Mm 
our information ecosystem, for better and certainly for worse, has been democratized in a way it has not ever been before. And so because of that, I, I say this sometimes when I write or have a colleague who writes something that's a little controversial, people get mad about. Look, if you're right, history, history bears you out that way, right? And that so often as writers, certainly as journalists, my job is to write down true things. Whether they pull well, whether they make me popular, whether they, those are secondary concerns. Because if it's true, eventually that truth will be acknowledged. Um, I almost feel some of the backlash recently um, during the protests after mm -hmm. George Floyd, mm -hmm. um, because so many young people, and it was multiracial, and you notice that you know after that point, um, DeSantis even puts out a rule to say, oh, it's okay to hit you know protests yeah, so and things like over. that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel because there were so many people across the board that protested, mm -hmm. I think some of the backlash has to do with that as well because they're getting to young minds like you mentioned. Unquestionably. Uh, one, of the, one of the examples I read about in the book is, and I, and I, I tackle and write a little bit about the rise of Black Lives Matter as a movement and the rising of this kind of new anti-racist movement and these fights over equity and how those further play into, how that plays into this tug of war in these directions, right? And I think it's unquestionably true, right? What could be more threatening? I, I, think, that, I think that speaks to it. There, there are some, I have some colleagues and there are some historians who talk about, I was just talking to a longtime activist a few weeks ago and, he, and he, he describes it as like, and frankly black activists have been describing this this way for a hundred years, right? But this is like white supremacy's last stand. Like this is gonna, but they're gonna go down swinging. Right? And all that, it's, but it speaks to this idea of, no, 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 we do have like a multiracial majority. Like we have, like we've got like, this massive movement from where it was. Right, like we, we do, ha the average person on the street doesn't want to live in such a world, does want a level of equality and equity, does want, right? That the reason there's such a thrashing is because there is a desperation, because it is radical, because they are trying to stop something that is, that, that is, that feels to them and that feels to us very often that is inevitable. And I think the challenge for us is is remembering that it's not inevitable because they are so determined to stop it. And that this increased desperation, again, the idea, I mean, truly, what Timothy McVeigh did in the 90s was relatively unthinkable to someone of his exact same politics 20 or 30 years earlier. The idea that you would massacre children and innocent people, to, that's not what the Klan did. They didn't think black people were people, so I mean, they did do that such things, right? But it was different. There were a lot of white people in that building. There were a lot of people who he would have thought, like, but that suddenly the desperation justified a totally, to them, different level and conception of violence. And so the danger is, like, that's the moment we're living in. Yeah, no, 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 let's go overrun democracy instead of allowing this thing to happen. Right, and so again, um, it, it speaks to how far we've moved, and and the fact that we do have a pro-democracy supermajority, that we do have people who want and desperately get this, and even when we don't understand it, right? It was like, don't even tell me all the details. What's the equal one and the good one? I'll vote for that. <laughs> Let's not actually get into exactly how much more I have to pay in taxes or exactly. Like, right? We have a lot of people like that, right? Like, no, no, no. We understand there are things that aren't quite working, and we want them to work. But it's, but it's that, that s segment of our society, and it doesn't have to be a very big one, even as I would I argue has expanded, you know, going from 5% to 10% <laughs> is big in a moment like this, especially when we're talking about people who are willing to commit acts like this. And so, um, unquestionably, I think the rise in these anti-racist movements, and not just that, Movements like Occupy Wall Street and Bernie Sanders' movement, movements like Me Too, and and the advancements for women, the the massive advancements in our LGBTQ movements. Right, we live in a world today where same-sex marriage is the law of the land, something that was relatively unthinkable not that long ago. 
Not, some people was unthinkable the day Barack Obama was elected. Right. right? So we are seeing things, fundamental societal shifts that both speak to what's possible that we can fight for, but that also will always then prompt some of that pullback because of the anxiety that it will spark to. Well, on that note, we are going to have to leave our conversation here. There's so much more that we could talk about, but please join me in thanking Wesley Lowry for a wonderful conversation and for a great book. Thank you all for being here. Um, Philadelphia is one of my favorite cities. Uh, my dad grew up in South Jersey uh, for a long time, and so we spent a lot of time coming back here. Um, and so I am as book toured out as I am. It was very important <laughs> for me to be here with you all. Um, and I love the back and forth. I love the conversations. You guys could tell I was going extra long on all my responses because I have no self-control. Um, but <laughs> I say that to say, um, Thank you for being here, and feel free to reach out to me in any capacity. I mean, I'll be here signing and hanging out, right? But um, if you get the book, if you read the book, or even if you don't, you just hated everything I said and want to let me know, <laughs> I, I, will, I, I really enjoy the, the sharpening of thought and the exploration from having the conversations. And so always feel free if there's ever anything I can do, anything you want to tell me I'm full of shit on, like whatever, you know, <laughs> always feel free to reach out. And thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for being readers. Um, it is so important, like I said, especially in this moment, um, that even as, like I said, I think maybe our balance between uh, equality for all and, and, and liberty for all and, and speech might be a little out of whack. I am certainly someone who truly believes in the power of ideas, the power of writing, and the power of this discourse. And we are at a time where we're burning books, where we're seeing ideas come under attack. And the way we all combat that is by showing with our wallets and our feet and where we show up that we support this type of discourse in our society. And so that's buying a book when we, when we walk past our bookstore or, check, or making sure we still have a library card. Um, and uh, because we know that that is as much as stuff is digitized that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a physical book guy. So, like I said, I say all that to say, thank you again for being here. Um, and it's so great seeing all of you. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you some more. So thank you guys again. Mm -hmm.